awareness is uh, a term we often use and we mix it up with certain other terms. So in order to avoid any semantic problem, I thought at the outset I would tell you what I mean by the word awareness. So we stick to that definition during this discussion here. I believe that we all have a potential consciousness. Potentially we can be conscious of many things. This potential awareness in man I call consciousness. When I speak of consciousness, it is not necessary that of, of what we are conscious, we can be immediately aware. We need not be immediately aware. Awareness may come later. Awareness then is the immediate part of consciousness, the contemporary part of consciousness. What we are conscious of now is our awareness. What we can be aware of tomorrow is consciousness. What we were aware of yesterday but have forgotten is consciousness. So consciousness is a much larger term. It includes potential awareness. But awareness is only what is contemporaneously immediately available. Then out of awareness there is a smaller segment called attention. We may be aware of this entire room, the picture this side, I am talking, this is a tape recorder. But you may be attending to me, in which case out of the awareness of this whole room, your attention may be fixed on a small part, that is me speaking to you. So awareness is a small fraction of consciousness and attention is a small fraction of awareness. I will be using these terms in that sense. Human beings are conscious because that is the only state in which they can have any experience. When one is not conscious, there can be no experience. In fact, when we speak of a world around us, what is that world except the world of which we are conscious? If our consciousness expands and we become aware of another world, then that becomes our world. I remember long ago as a child going into a park in India where there was a special kind of fruit. In each fruit, which was a closed fruit almost like a pear, there were thousands of little living beings, living things, like little worms. When you would open the fruit, all those living things would walk away. And I used to wonder that till that fruit is opened up, for them that is their world all congested together inside. They had no experience of any world outside. They were not conscious of any other world, therefore they had no other world. When their consciousness is opened up to another world, then the world becomes big. Today we have limitations upon our consciousness and we are conscious of a certain world. Therefore we say that is the world. It does not mean there is no other world. The world which we experience is the world of our consciousness. Consciousness then is a limitation upon the world. If we are conscious, then only a world comes into being. And to the extent we are conscious, the world exists. When we were not conscious of some new discoveries made at the fringes of space, for us they did not exist. Today they exist. Tomorrow we may find entirely new discovery. We may find that living beings moving at high velocities have been around us all the time. We never noticed them because we didn't have the means to notice them. When those means are developed, we may say this was a very crowded world, but those beings we never noticed. We will of course claim that they always existed, but we will claim that they always existed at that point when we become conscious of them. In that sense, we are creating our own world through the realm of consciousness. There is a whistle called the dog whistle. Some of you might have seen it or heard it. When you blow it, you can't hear it, but the dog can hear it. Because its vibrations are slightly highly, too highly pitched for the human ear. But it is not too highly pitched for the dog's ear. So people use it and they blow the whistle. Nobody hears, but the dog can hear and come. For the dog, the whistle is real. The sound of that whistle is real. For us, it is not. Is it not possible? that so many things are around us but are outside 
the pitch and range of our senses. We say the world is there because we can see it. We are aware of it because we can see it, touch it, we can have perception of it. But what is this perception? When we look at the world with our eyes, we can only see those things which in their vibrations are between then the red and the violet. If on the spectrum things exist which in their vibration, in their rate of movement are faster or slower than the vibrations of the range of colors in the spectrum from violet to red, we will not see them. But the nature of that experience will be identical with the nature of experience we see. Then are we not limiting the world which we can see to the power of the eyes to see? Supposing we had a, a new eyes, supposing a new generation is born with eyes which can see ultraviolet rays, eyes which can see infrared rays, the whole world will look different at once. No new world will be created but the world will become different. To the extent our perceptions are limited, we create a limited world. If our perceptions are larger, we see a larger world. Our consciousness then, which uses these perceptive mechanisms, limits the size of the world we see. Many people believe that we are in a position to become aware of this world, to be conscious of it, because we have sense perceptions. In other words, people genuinely and sincerely believe that because we have eyes, therefore we can see. I have a proposition to make that because we have eyes, we can only see as much as our eyes can see. Maybe if we didn't have these kinds of eyes, but different kind, we would see something more. These eyes are not helping us to see, they are limiting what we can see. Their range is so limited. Similarly, our ears can hear. There may be sounds which are beyond the range of this eardrum. We can't hear them, so we say there is no such music. If we had different ears, we would hear the music. It is possible that there is so much to see and so much to hear around us, but we are limiting what we see and hear because of the limitations of our sense perceptions. Then the sense perceptions are not an aid to seeing, they are limitations upon seeing. This was first realized by those people who experimented with consciousness and wanted to see if consciousness can function independent from sense perceptions. They wanted to see what would happen if we close our eyes and shut off the capacity to see. And they found that even after they closed their eyes, they could see things which they remembered. They could see things imaginatively. And to their horror and surprise, they found that the nature of seeing imaginatively was identical with the nature of seeing with these eyes. Seeing was no different. It wasn't that you weren't seeing. Sometimes we try to reject that experiment by saying, Oh, you are imagining. Okay, imagining in what way? Imagining and seeing. You see a thing that you imagine. Right now, the uh, name Curtis Hotel is not before us. We can imagine and see it. Now when we see it before us, is the seeing in any way different than what we are seeing now? The nature of seeing is identical with the sea. But having got so used to seeing with these eyes, we reject that as not seeing. In fact, the capacity to see lies in that seeing and not in this. It lies in the capacity to be conscious, to be able to imagine. Supposing we lost the capacity to imagine, supposing we were unconscious, we wouldn't even see with these eyes. A man who is unconscious his eyes are open, he can't see. We say we see because of the images formed on the retina and their messages car be carried through the optic nerve to the brain center. All the messages are still going on of an unconscious man whose eyes are open, but he's not seeing. When he becomes conscious, he can see. Consciousness is the secret of seeing, not the eyes. Some yogis attempted the process of seeing without eyes. And they said, let us see what we can see if we did not use these eyes for seeing. So they closed these eyes, withdrew their attention, concentrated upon the power to see, 
and they saw everything they found they could see much more they discovered for once that the power to see lay somewhere else and these eyes were a limitation upon seeing in the same way they found that the power to hear existed in our consciousness and these ears only limited what we could hear the power to feel lay in consciousness and these hands limited what we could feel and so on the sense perceptions did not enable us to see and perceive they restricted what we could see and perceive therefore they began to see and perceive without the sense perception leave aside the yogis take a simple example of imagination i am standing here and i conduct an experiment with you that while you are all sitting there imaginatively you walk up along the aisle each one of you get up walk along the aisle come over here just avoiding all these tape recorders look where the tape recorders are avoid them avoid these wires shake my hand firmly having shaken my hand walk back the same way go and sit down on your places you've all done that while i was explaining you've just done it you had the experience of seeing these wires you had the experience of touching my hand and you've been sitting there all the time then where did the experience come from where was it in what part of awareness it was in the same consciousness through which we are seeing other ways the capacity to have perceptions and to see and touch and feel lies within consciousness and not in the physical perceptions this is the first lesson we learn about awareness for once we begin to understand that awareness is not confined to picking up perceptions from an external experience that awareness can be generated inside us through consciousness it has been described as inner awareness inner awareness is not confined to sensory perceptions like we find that this body senses are not required physical senses are not required for perception similarly we find with experimentation that sensory perceptions are not required for perception if i want to see a glass i touch it i see it the water is there i taste it what has happened i have the perception of a glass of cold water is it necessary to break this perception of the glass of cold water into seeing touching hearing tasting separately can't i have the perception of this glass of water directly i can mentally mental perception does not require perception to be broken up in fact in trying to have the perception of this glass through sensory perceptions i have broken up the glass into the into its vis- visible form into its touch into the rattle of the ice in it i have broken up the experience of a glass into pieces just to be able to see just to be able to have the perception of a glass if i used my mind and not the sense perceptions i could straight away mentally perceive the glass of water with everything intact to it without breaking up the perception into different functional senses functional senses then are not necessary for perception in fact they restrict what we can perceive the mind can perceive far beyond the sensory perceptions this is a coarse experience of a glass take a refined experience take an experience of something which cannot be seen in this sense take the experience of beauty take the experience of intelligence take the experience of love what will you see what will you hear what will you touch yet you can have the perception directly mentally you know what it means when i throw before you the concept of beauty it, you catch it without seeing without hearing without touching what part of human awareness is catching the perception of beauty the human mind the mind then is capable of perception without having to break it up into sensory perception mental perception then is a higher degree of inner awareness but mental perception also functions in time it takes time even to perceive beauty mental perception requires the laws of causation to be formed 
higher than mental perception is what we might call spiritual or soul perception that we perceive directly by experiencing it by being it it is one thing to experience a glass of water by holding it by tasting it by touching it it's quite another thing to be to experience a glass of water by becoming a glass of water since we don't want to become a glass of water that's not the kind of experience we would like to have at that high level of awareness but there are experiences which we would like to have at that level experience of beauty we like to have the experience of beauty by becoming beautiful then do we see we see nothing but we have the experience directly of beauty we talk of god as the ultimate creator as our totality he is total can we have experience of god there is only one way of experiencing god that is to become god the question has been asked whether man can see god and the answer is no because by the time man sees god he is god there is no man left and while man lasts there is no god because man is separated from god and there is no god from which from which anything can be separated therefore the highest kind of perception experience would not be the experience of perception at all it would be the experience of becoming whatever you want to experience you become that god realization means the experience of becoming god the experience of becoming total and not seeing a power which is less than total if you can see something it can't be total because you are separate from it then awareness can take so many forms and the more inwards we move towards awareness the less the reliance upon these tools of perception sometimes it is said that if we can become god and we are god why don't we have that experience <clears throat> right now the, the answer is simple i'll give you a small example take the example of a small pool of water over which the beautiful moon is shining the moon shines in the sky beautiful steady still in the sky and it should reflect in the pool of water but the pool has got dirt at the bottom so when we stir the water of the pool the mud the dirt comes up and makes the water turbid outside the pool we have fixed a small mirror put up on a frame where the mirror can move in different directions now the moon is falling the image is falling on the mirror from the mirror it goes into the pool and we are looking into the pool that is the situation when the water settles down and the reflection of the moon comes we can see the moon when we move the mirror the moon moves in the water we say that's a beautiful moon see how it moves in fact the moon is not moving the reflection is moving not because the moon is moving the reflection is moving because the reflector is moving the mirror moves and gives motion to the moon whereas the original moon of which it is a reflection is not moving then we create little ripples in the water and the moon breaks up into little pieces and we say look so many pieces of this moon are there in this water the moon has not broken up into pieces it's still there all whole in the sky we think it's broken into pieces because the water the medium in which the reflection is taking place is breaking up into ripples when you stir the water a little more and the mud and dirt comes up and you don't see the moon at all and we say the moon has gone away the moon has not gone away anywhere it's still there we can't see it because we have stirred the water and stopped the reflective action believe me this is our state of awareness we have our own light of consciousness which can create all awarenesses shining like the moon inside us but the light passes through the reflector of our own mind and as the mind moves that light changes and we think everything is in motion the light of human consciousness is steady and unmoving but reflected through the mind it seems to have a change and continuous motion the experience of consciousness when it moves further through sense perceptions breaks up the, into the ripples on the surface of the water sense perceptions are nothing more than ripples upon the water they break up the experience separately into seeing hearing touching tasting smelling and when the water becomes muddy we don't see anything at all this body the body senses is that 
mud coming out. Our desires for the world take our attention out, refuse to let us see the beautiful moon of our own soul shining within ourselves. How can we see it within ourselves? The answer is simple. Let the waters settle down. Let the mud and dirt settle down. Which means, let these desires that draw us away from ourselves settle down. When we withdraw from the desires that take us out into the world, we settle down, we can see our own consciousness but split up into pieces. Let the sensory perceptions be quieted. The water becomes still. When our senses are still, we can see the moon shining and moving from place to place. Let the mind become still. The moon does not move. In this body, with these senses, with this mind, we can see our own consciousness as bright, as still, as beautiful as it actually is if we do this exercise. To gather inner awareness of our own potential, these are the exercises we have to do. We can get back to an experience of our own real self, of our own shining bright self. We can have experience of our own total self. We can have experience of God if we are able to still the reflectors. God doesn't move. He is there. Through reflections and through moving reflectors, He seems to be creating a moving world which we perceive in the manner in which we are doing. We can go back into inner awareness by reversing this process and stilling each stage of the reflector. The point I was making was that the medium through which awareness passes gives form and structure to that awareness. Outer awareness is all colored and conditioned by these reflectors through which it is possible. And we have begun to believe that we have no capacity to have any other awareness except outward awareness. It is strange. There are billions of people upon this earth and you go around and ask them that from the time of their birth till the time of death, what have they been doing? To their attention and you will find that they have been giving their attention to the experience outside. A child on birth starts crying, starts seeking that which is outside of himself and the rest of his life is clinging to what is outside of himself. He gets so engrossed in the experience outside of himself that he never has time to look back who is experiencing this. Who is the experiencer? The experience takes away all our time. We have no time for the experiencer within ourselves. We have never stopped. Even now, we know there is an experience outside. We are involved in it. Who is involved? We don't pause to see. If we could just reverse this direction and have a quick look as to who is the experiencer of this experience outside, we would have had inner awareness. But we don't pause. Entire lifetime. It is strange. I can't understand how this direction can be maintained so consistently that we should only look at what is happening outside and never look to whom it is happening. We never care to go within and find out if anything in consciousness is also worth seeing, is also worth experiencing. But it's only the external experience which consciousness is picking up. The result is we are tied up to outward awareness and we lose the beautiful potential of inner awareness. Why should I advocate inner awareness? I am advocating inner awareness because it gives freedom. I have mentioned that outer awareness ties us down to its own limitations. Outer awareness involves us with people. Each involvement ties us down. Every bit of outer experience through desire through wishes, through wish fulfillment, desire fulfillment, through emotional and other involvements. Every outward experience binds us down, chains us. And we feel like slaves. We are helpless. And we howl and we cry and we are tight. Every time we have inner experience, we break those chains and discover our own self. Inner experience releases us from this bondage, makes us free. The more inner awareness we have, the freer we are. And if we have total inner awareness, we are completely free. Freedom of a human being is possible only through inner awareness. 
No man can be bound down by his external chains. But every man can be bound down by outward experience. And we are all bound. We think we can will ourselves and get out of this experience. But so long as the experience is external and binds us down, we don't even have the freedom to use our will. Even that gets bound down. We get completely conditioned. The conditioned soul, conditioned mind, conditioned senses, conditioned body responds to things around itself in a set pattern as if a computer has, de has designed the life for this human being. Where is the freedom? We lose all freedom by losing inner awareness. Therefore I advocate. I am a great exponent of freedom. And I think human freedom means conscious freedom. The capacity to take free decisions. Today, in ignorance of our inner self, we are taking conditioned decisions. Preconditioned decisions. Predetermined decisions. What is our decision? We have no hand in deciding where we will be born. Once we are born, the mother and the others around us start making decisions for us. We live a whole life where decisions are being made by people and circumstances around us. And still, we are fooled into believing that some of the decisions we are making ourselves. We are placed in circumstances and conditions where we have no option but to make the decision that we make. And yet we think it is our decision. Because we are slaves to the external awareness, to the external circumstances which have bound us down. If we could free ourselves and understand the nature of that experience, we would find we have the power, the freedom to take decisions even about the, about the circumstances outside of us. That all circumstances can be changed through freedom. Everything can be changed through freedom. Through freedom of consciousness. If we are free, the whole world belongs to us. We are on top of the world. And if we are bound down, the whole world is upon us. And we are slaves of the world. It makes so much difference. Therefore, I recommend that we must all, having potential inner awareness, experience inner awareness, so that we become free from bondage arising out of external experience. Inner awareness also helps us to understand the nature of other human beings. For example, if I meet another person today, I take him very seriously, I get involved and I get upset. Supposing I took him as an actor, as a player upon the stage, I wouldn't be so upset. What is there to show whether we are acting or not? In fact, we are all acting. We are all wearing masks and we know it. We know what we are and when we deal with people, we put on masks. And we know we are wearing masks, we are acting. Each one of us is acting. And yet we take the play to be a serious real life. We wear masks and have a very horrible play. At least if we want to play, we can take off the masks and play happily and lovingly. Because then everybody will know what everybody is. Now nobody knows and we are all afraid of each other. We are in doubt and uncertainty about each other. We are wearing so much masks, sometimes mask over mask. Sometimes we play the game of removing masks and we keep many masks underneath. <laughs> we know how we have developed ourselves. It is continuously living in a stage which we take as real. We have said many times this world is like a big play. It's going on. Play your role very well. Act well. We can't act well because we take it too seriously. We take it as real, as absolutely really real. How can we act? Only if we have inner awareness and see the roles set for us. We don't have to suggest to ourselves that this is acting, we will know it is acting. And we will act beautifully. An actor, these days, if there is a good actor, he must act as if it is real. A good actor, if he comes to know that he is acting, even then will not say he is acting. Supposing the grocery man takes part in a small play in the townhouse, playhouse, and becomes a king on the stage, he has to act like the king. Supposing during the act he says, now look folks, I am not the king, I am just the old grocery man. He has told the truth but damaged the play. He is not a good actor. Telling the truth does not make a good actor. 
acting your role makes you good actor here people are acting and they think they are the kings when they come to know they are grocery men they damage the play by saying they are grocery men they neither know how to tell lies nor do they know how to tell the truth <laughs> in both ways they damage themselves and suffer the real secret of understanding the play is to be aware of the play and still act well this is not possible by merely suggesting to yourself that it's the play but by knowing personally directly through awareness how the play was set in the first place that comes only by inner awareness when we have inner awareness we know how the play was set in the first place why we are doing what we are doing when we sit to watch a stage play and we sit in the audience when we watch a movie on the screen and sit in the audience so many things happen there in which we are involved because the movie is very moving it has got tragic tragic scenes it's got people killing each other there are jealousies there are ingratitude there are such feelings of human suffering and tragedy shown upon the film that we get moved we cry we are glued to our seats you should see the faces of the people by taking a flash photo of an audience in one of those seats it looks the things are happening to all of them and yet none of them leaves their chair to run and stop the thing because in spite of the involvement in the play they know it's acting it's a play it's, a, it's on the screen therefore they watch it but they don't run to it here we have set a beautiful four dimensional five dimensional play around us in this beautiful five dimensional screen around us which we call the world and we through consciousness are watching this show at the moment through perceptions but here we don't stop at watching and enjoying the show or getting moved with it we run into it we try to tear up the screen into bits <laughs> we try to interfere in a play because we are not really sure it's a play we think it must be real believe me human problems could be solved in one stroke if we knew that the human drama was a drama and a play and if we looked at it like that at least the one who looks at it like that will never have pain and suffering the way he has to even in the most painful situation he'll enjoy the drama and get away with it we are supposed to sit in inner awareness behind this opening this door the window you are supposed to sit behind the window these eyes are our windows we should have sat in an easy chair cushioned easy chair behind the eyes in the window and peeped out and seen the passing show the lovely carnival going out instead of sitting there we move out we run out all the time we lose in our awareness in order to get involved in the outer awareness it is very important that we reverse we reverse this trend and move inward and capture the beauty of inner awareness by which the beauty of outer awareness comes up automatically how the show is a play comes to be known when we awake to inner awareness it is like going to sleep and having a dream when we sleep and have a dream we see a lot of people there this big drama going on and we talk to them they talk to us we fight with them they fight back they hurt us we scream we can have nightmares and yet when we get up awake we find this all a drama it is only while we have lost the awareness of wakefulness that we are hurt and moved in that sense by a dream when we are awake and we have a day dream we are not moved we just enjoy it we enjoy every day dream and we are screaming in every nightmare because of the lack of awareness of the wakeful state if we are aware that it's a dream we would not be frightened here we are projecting this beautiful play around us we are capturing the show within the limitations of our conscious processes within the limitations of awareness as possible through sense perceptions through the mind through the soul in that drama which we capture which is our world we are not willing to watch watch this show as if it is a show within our awareness we begin to watch it as a show and it's beautiful you take it from me that the very life which bothers us so much today 
if we could look at it as a play, it wouldn't bother us. But suggesting to ourselves it's a play is one thing and knowing that it's a play is another. When we suggest to ourselves, we are still acting in the play. We keep on saying, oh, take it as a play, take it as a play. Taking it as a play is one thing and knowing that it's a play is another thing. Inner awareness helps us not in taking life as a play, but in knowing it is a play. Because indeed it is. Like a dream is a creation of the mind during sleep state, this wakeful drama outside is a dream, is an experience of the mind, of consciousness, while we are asleep in a still higher wakeful state. These are successive levels of experience and the experience is called creation. When we talk of successive levels of creation, creating what? Creating experience. Do we have any proof of anything existing except its experience? If somebody were to say, are you sure this glass is there? I'll say I'm sure. How do you know it? Because I have experience of the glass. Ah, that means you are sure of the experience of the glass, not the glass. But what's the difference? The difference is you can have experience of the glass without the glass being there. How come? Well, you have it in a dream. When you dream about a glass of water, you have the same glass of water. When you drink it, it has cool. Everything is identical. When you wake up, there was no glass. If in a state of dream, we can create the experience of a glass, without there being a glass, why should we assume that we can't do it now, from a higher level of consciousness? We could be sleeping still at a different level of consciousness and we could awake to inner awareness where we would find that the glass never existed, but the experience of the glass existed. Is there any means of establishing whether anything exists except the experience? There is no means. But those who have awakened to higher states have direct proof that the experience alone exists. Sometimes one is little bothered by this thought that how can be that the experience of things exist and things don't exist? How can that be? But that is the truth. If in a dream somebody hits me with a, with a knife, I'll get pain. And if I wake up, the pain is still real. The memory of that pain is still a real memory of a real pain. But the knife will not be real. It won't be there. The knife was never there. It is not necessary to have a real knife to create the experience of pain. Merely use of awareness in dream can create that. There is a very interesting story which illustrates this point from, the, from some of our Swamis in India. One Swami Shankara used to live in Bombay. And the story goes that he was walking along a street where a magician lived. A magician was one who had the power by illusion to make th thing look what it was not. So the magician made a piece of string look like a snake and threw it on the street. When this Swami went there, he told his disciples, look, what do you see on the street? And the disciples said, Sir, we see a snake. And one of the disciples, who had done better homework than the others, he stepped forward and he said, Sir, in truth, it's a piece of string. But it looks like, it appears to be a snake because of illusion. It's illusion that it's a snake. In fact, it's just a piece of string. He says, are you sure? And the disciple says, Sir, you taught me this method. I'm quite sure. In reality, it's just a piece of string, in illusion. In appearance, it's like a snake. He said, young man, if you are so sure that it's a piece of string, why don't you go and pick it up? So the young man stepped forward and he picked up the snake. And the snake coiled around his arm and ultimately bit him. And he said, ouch! <laughs> and then the Swami said, in some dreams you take it absolutely real. So the nature of dreams is different. Some are multicolored dreams, some are monocolored. Most of the dreams are monocolored. These dreams arise from different parts of awareness. That part of the awareness which we pick up through memory in the wakeful state and goes into the subconscious. When that comes into the dream, those are lower order of dreams. Most of our dreams are now 
dreams which pick up elements of creation creation of the dream from subconscious levels the forgotten levels what happened to us in the wakeful state we have forgotten it and that has gone into the subconscious and in the dream state we pick up those elements and bring them out either in the in their original form or in a modified symbolic form but when you have a higher inner awareness in the wakeful state the dreams begin to pick up things even from the higher states and they are not merely from the subconscious they pick up things from superconscious states from still higher levels so those dreams are different dreams which take their material from subconscious states are generally monocolored they are not black and white they are buff colored and white the shades of the skin color i don't know if you ever noticed it in most of the dreams that come there are no colors you just see things happening passing in in this kind of when you close your eyes against the light the kind of colors you see those are the colors of the dreams but in vivid dreams you see blues and yellows and dark reds and those colors come up especially blues and yellows you will notice those are higher dreams the more you develop your inner awareness the more you will have dreams of that kind so dreams are themselves of many classes but the dream sequences change along with your development of inner awareness and they help you in your wakeful state all dreams help us in our wakeful state even today like sleep helps us in wakeful state similarly dreams help us in wakeful state they relax us they release the tensions that we built in our subconscious we try to suppress something we try to forget it we say let's forget it there is no capacity in human consciousness in total consciousness to forget anything we don't have it you can forget it from awareness you can't forget it from consciousness so when we say let's forget it we push it down from consciousness into some part in from awareness into some part of consciousness either subconscious or superconscious when it goes into subconscious we think we have forgotten in the dream it comes back to us because although we have said forget it we couldn't really forget it so it comes up there and helps us to overcome the fear the worry the problem the botheration for which we were trying to forget it when we wake up again we are better off for such a dream so it depends when you have dreams of a higher order they help you in the wakeful state but it's a big subject of dreams one can't give one Can set to one second sure it is possible to plan your dreams yes i was interviewed uh, in this country last year i think it was uh, in detroit michigan last year along with another girl who written a book on how to induce dreams dreams to solve our wakeful problems there's a book available she wrote that book and she was interviewed along with me there she has suggested that you can induce a dream in order to get over tensions and i know many children are taught this technique of inducing a good dream so that they have a sound sleep they are told to imagine a chain of events and as they think along they are tired they go to sleep and they induce a dream based upon that chain and that dream helps them so you can induce dreams up to a certain extent yes oh um, some dream looks like tibet and we did talk about the possibility of waking up at the time of death and wonder if you could talk about Um, what the process would be and what the conditions might be for waking up at that time if you haven't awakened to higher states of consciousness in this life prior to that time. Well, you can awaken at the time of death because at the time of death we are only shedding this physical body not the rest of the conscious process. So at that time the conscious process can develop its own awareness and awake. In fact, unless we are transferring to another form of experience we awake and discover what we are and then we may go into another form or not so the possibility of awakening at death is always there because death is nothing more than shedding of this external shell the rest of it remains intact senses mind soul total soul they all remain together as one unit sometimes we describe this entire unit as the soul we say the soul of this man is left his body but they are not referring technically to a soul they are referring to this entire complex And that awakens to a higher level of awareness at the time of death. Tibetans have spoken of it. The yogis have spoken of it, and all the Oriental uh, mystics have spoken of it. In fact, the mystics that 
described waking up during life as dying while living. And they have advocated that if you want to experience wakefulness, die while living. That means have the same experience which you will have after death. Because death in any case will awaken. And this, uh, uh, this business of dying while living is uh, brought out in a lovely parrot story which I might tell you. I like to tell stories about birds. And this is one of the bird stories. There was once upon a time a merchant from India who used to go to East Africa for business. And in Africa he used to pass near a forest, a jungle. There was a parrot jungle. There were a lot of parrots in that jungle. So one day he was passing through that par parrot jungle when he saw lovely birds. So he decided to take one home. So he picked up one of the nice parrots, put it in a cage and brought it home to India. In due course, the parrot danced and enjoyed himself and ate food and sang and was merry in his cage. Next year, when the merchant came back to Africa, he asked the parrot, do you want to send any message to your folks back in Africa? And the parrot said, yeah, tell them I am enjoying myself in my cage. I eat, drink and I am dancing and very happy. So the merchant came to Africa and in due course reached the same forest, the same jungle and met the birds and he called them together. He said, come here folks, I have a message from the guy who went with me last year to India. And they all gathered around him. And he said, you remember I took one parrot with me in, in a cage to India? He has sent a message to you. He says he is enjoying himself in his cage and he is laughing and drink, dining and drinking and happy. He is having a good time. When he was telling this message, one of the parrots sitting in front had tears in his eyes. And the moment he finished the message, that parrot dropped down dead. This merchant felt very sad. He said, this must be a very dear friend of that parrot that he could not bear to hear this message. And he died. Oh, I am a foolish merchant to have carried this story to these parrots. I did not realize that one parrot will lose his life. Anyway, he went this way. In due course, he returned to India. When he came back to India, he told the parrot in the cage. He said, I conveyed your message to the parrots there. But it, is, it appears that one parrot was a very dear friend of yours. Because when I told your message, he had tears in his eyes and he dropped down dead. When he said this, the parrot in the cage had tears in his eyes and dropped down dead. He said, oh, you foolish merchant. Having seen once that that guy, that friend couldn't stand it, why should you have come and repeated it here and killed this parrot also? He was very sad. Anyway, he opened the cage and threw the dead bird out. As soon as he threw the bird out, the bird flew up and sat on a tree. And he said, oh, you aren't dead after all? And the bird said, no, I'm not dead, nor is that other one dead in the forest. He only sent a message to me that if you want to get out of the cage, die while living. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this is a good story to illustrate the Eastern concept uh, <laughs> that we are in this cage, we are caught up in this cage, and if we want to get out of this cage, we must have the experience of death while we are still alive. <coughs> yes, Ishwar, may I request that you repeat that poem about the sparrow? Another <laughs> <laughs> bird story. <laughs> uh, that's a little story. I tell people who are too much under tension. <laughs> Said the sparrow to the robin, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush around and worry so. Said the robin to the sparrow, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. <laughs> That's a short bird point. <laughs> It really shows that how we try to rely upon ourselves, mm -hmm. upon the reality of objects around, and get more and more miserable. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shishwar Pori.